Hello. So yeah, um, I'm Sam Beckham. I'm here to talk about lessons from leadership. Uh, it's got nothing to do with WordPress. I actually haven't used WordPress in... I haven't used a microphone in a while either. I haven't used <laughs> WordPress in about 15 years. So uh, forgive me for, for not understanding the rest of the talks today. But uh, hopefully these lessons, these are lessons I learned from when I uh, worked alongside the leadership at GitLab, um, how I applied them to my usual role, which is not working alongside them, and hopefully how, how you can uh, apply them to, to your roles and, and your lives as well too. Um, so as I said, my name is Sam Beckham. Uh, you can find me on the internet at sam.beckham.io. This is where I would usually put my social media, but that's a hellhole right now. So there's, there's no social media. We're going old school. This is a website. Uh, there is the full version of this talk on there as well. Uh, this is a little bit condensed to fit in at the 20 minutes, but there's a, a transcript of the fuller version, which has a little bit more details. But there's, there's time for questions at the end as well. Um, as I said, I work at GitLab. Uh, my usual role is that of engineering manager. I manage the foundations team, so we do anything that kind of sort of spans across all of GitLab. So things like the, the navigation settings, we look at the design system, that sort of thing. Uh, we've just redesigned the navigation, which is a fantastic and terrifying experience because people have opinions. Um, but yeah, uh, that's what I do normally. But I'm here to talk about when I was the acting chief of staff to the CTO. This is something I did uh, last August to November. It was a three-month role. It was deliberately, uh, deliberately three months. That's what the acting part means. I only did it for a short period of time. And then somebody else uh, picked it up after me. Uh, chief of staff, that part basically means uh, like a, it's like a assistive, not, no, it's not an assistive role. It's like a strategic role. So you're working alongside them. You're working with them. You're not sorting out their calendars, you're not kind of um, running errands for them, that kind of thing. You're active, I was actively working with the chief of staff and the, the VPs of all the different engineering um, departments as well. Uh, to the CTO is there because we have a chief of staff at GitLab and that's the chief of staff to the CEO. Uh, this is all unnecessarily complicated. The point is I worked alongside the chief of staff for three months. I learned a lot of things. Here's what I learned. Um, I'm also going to call it Chief of Staff going forward because it's much easier to say. Not technically true, but that's, uh, again, much easier. So, as I said, here to talk about what I actually learned. Um, I've split this into six different categories that not coincidentally map to our GitLab values. These are not exactly what they're written down as, but they, they make a little more sense if I word them this way. Uh, and that is collaborate effectively, drive results, be efficient, include everyone, iterate continually and be transparent by default. Um, and all of these kind of come together uh, to show that communication is crucial, right? So if you get communication right, and this applies to everything, if you're getting the communication right, it's 90% it's of, of what you're doing, right? So um, when things were communicated well, they generally went well. When things weren't communicated well, that's when things started uh, going a bit wrong. Something Eric, the CTO at GitLab at the time, taught me very early on was that for a message to be repeated, no, nope, to be heard, it should be repeated three times in three different places and in three different ways. Um, now, the three is fairly arbitrary here. The point is you should over-communicate. You should feel like a broken record. He also said if you don't feel silly repeating yourself, then you're not doing it enough. So if you don't feel silly repeating yourself, then you, that's an awful joke. Let's move on. <laughs> So into the lessons. Uh, the first lesson I learned was use a single source of truth. Um, at GitLab, that's our company handbook. Um, I've already had one person talk to me about this today, so great, we're doing something good. Um, this is at GitLab, a uh, totally open source, um, public handbook. Uh, it's a statically hosted website, so the website itself is public, the repository is public, all of the issues, merge requests, which is what we call pull requests, um, and all the discussions and things um, mostly public, right? So this is where we keep everything to do with the company. If you want to know how a team works, it's in the handbook. If you want to know what the parental leave policy is, it's in the handbook. If you want to know uh, what our company goals are for the quarter or the longer term ones, it's all in the handbook. And because it's a publicly hosted repository as well, you can dive in, you can see all of the, like who added certain things, you can see why they added it, you can see the discussions around it. 
Um, it's, it's super helpful to have not only let people self-serve and get the information they need, but get the reasons behind that information as well. Um, this is what we do. It's not for everyone. Uh, it works for some people. Some people find it trickier. The point isn't have a publicly hosted repository that builds a static website. The point is have one place that at least your employees can go to that, that has all the information they need. Um, and one place alone, so there's no conflicting information. Announce everywhere. Uh, this is another part of collaborating effectively. Um, the handbook is great, but it's, it's static. It's not easy to figure out what's changed uh, and when it's changed and why. Uh, so we, this is where we over communicate. This is where we say one thing uh, three times in three different places in three different ways. Uh, we will put things out on Slack, we will send emails, we will um, tag the, the people that need to know in GitLab, we'll make sure that managers are telling their reports and if they have reports they're telling theirs and we tell everyone and, and it, it, it goes everywhere essentially. But we always make sure we link back to the handbook so we're not creating multiple sources of truth by changing the wording slightly uh, when we message it to people. We say, hey this thing's changed this is what's changed, this is how it affects you, go read the update in the handbook. Um, this reduces the, the telephone effect where if, if one person changes something then that message can get, uh, it can be very different by the time it's gone through several different people. Um, so yeah, and now it's everywhere. Looking at results, uh, how do you know you're achieving things if you don't actually measure what you're doing, right? Um, we do this in several ways, uh, how we do it isn't as important as just actually doing it. So we look at, uh, we have OKRs, which are objectives and key results. That's a whole talk in itself, but essentially company goals for the quarter. Uh, we have KPIs, which are like longer term goals. So um, things like uh, reduce the number of security issues would be a quarterly uh, goal, but keep that number below a certain number would be one of the more long-term goals, right? So these things you want to keep um, keep measuring once you've hit that goal, so like you make sure it doesn't go back to where it was. Again, that could be a whole talk in itself. Apologies for, for going very quickly over these things. Um, but another part of results is measuring opposing metrics, right? So if you're measuring something, make sure you're measuring the side effects of that as well. So merge request rate is one of the things I measure as an engineering manager. This is where I look at how many merge requests on average my team's producing. It's not to look at individual people and say you're not merging enough code. It's not what it is. It's, it's just a baseline to see like are we shipping roughly the same amount as we were last month, last year, last quarter, whatever it is. Um, but one way to, to make this metric go up is to just care less about the quality of the code you're writing or to just phone in some of them things, right? So we also measure quality. We measure the other side of this. As I mentioned, we look at number of security issues. We look at number of regressions that came in. Um, we look at all sorts of other things. So we make sure we're not uh, gaming the system, essentially, and making sure that people, um, sorry, incentivizing the wrong things. Um, there are opposing metrics for other things. It's not just an engineering. So we'll measure things like um, number of diverse candidates, but we'll also measure um, pay quality at the same time as well, so we make sure we're not like increasing a pay gap whilst increasing diversity. That would be bad. Like, let's not do that. Um, we look at there's all sorts of other things, but the point is, make sure you're catching the side effects of the things that you're measuring and, and not incentivizing the wrong things without realizing. Being efficient. Now, this is one of my favorite ones, right? So, starting with a decision. This is something we can all do. Uh, this is something that I've. I did use a lot in my daily life as well now, right? Um, it's subtle, but it's super helpful. So when you're going into a discussion, it's really good to do your research and say, okay, we've, we've, got these, we've got this problem, we've got X, Y, and Z that could potentially solve this problem. But instead of going in with, with that, say, we've got this problem, we're gonna do X. We could also do Y and Z, but we're doing X. And then start the discussion from there. And then you've already got a decision. Um, so if somebody comes in and says, no, 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 like why is far better, like be open to that. You've got that discussion, you've got that person who maybe wouldn't have spoken up otherwise speaking up because 
they're like, mm, shit, if I don't speak up now, <laughs> X is going to happen and I don't want that to happen. If you're speaking to someone who doesn't really care how you do it, they just care it gets done, great, you're there, you've got that decision already. Um, I've been told 10 minutes, I'm moving on quickly. But start with the decision, right? Like, you, you'd be surprised how, how quickly this, uh, how much this can uh, help you with, with, with lots of things, right? Be a multiplier. Uh, so this is something that is especially true in leadership. Uh, the, the more people that, that report to you, the more you need to become a multiplier and not just an adder, right? So what this means is um, do things that help more people in a smaller way than would help less people in a bigger way, right? So instead of doing something yourself, uh, that's being an adder, do something small that helps several people do that thing quicker. Um, so... Uh, an example would be creating, or to be fair, a better example would be removing a process uh, that slows people down. Um, removing one extra required round of reviews from the, the merge request review process or pull request review process. Or creating a tool that helps loads of other people get their job done just that 1% quicker. Like It's far more efficient to make everybody else 1% more efficient than to try and stretch yourself to be 100% more efficient. Uh, so be efficient, be a multiplier. This is a very ironic slide to, uh, to give halfway through a talk, but shut up and listen, right? Uh, something I'm obviously not doing right now, but I will when the questions come. Um, th this is the, the, the bigger part of communication that a lot of people kind of brush over and forget. You don't want to just talk at people. You want to shut up and you want to listen to people. Um, you'd be surprised what you can hear when you actively listen and you create a platform for, for people to, to give you their opinions on, on whatever it is, on, on things that you've done, decisions you've made. Um, you know, you, we're, all, we're all human, we all make mistakes, we all do things wrong. If you shut up and listen, you catch these fairly early, right? Um, at GitLab, we had uh, office hours with the CTO where anyone could come along and talk about anything. Um, it was sometimes really quite fun when they'd made a particularly interesting decision and people would come along and, and be really blunt about kind of like, here's why this decision is bad. And then watching the, the CTO kind of um, take that on board and listen to them and, and actively uh, do something about that was, it, it was really helpful to, to see that, right? Because it encouraged more people to um, speak up because they knew they would be heard. So shut up and listen and, and be very deliberate about this. This is very, very similar to the, the previous one, but include everyone, right? Don't just shut up and listen to the same people all the time. Include everyone, regardless of who they are, where they're from, their standing in the company, uh, all of these things, right? Make sure everyone feels like they can come speak to you, right? Don't feel like they have to talk through their manager to you if, if this is kind of where you are in the company, right? Um, get opinions from everyone and make sure that, again, you should have and listened to them and they are heard. Uh, you, you'd be surprised what you hear from, from people that you wouldn't have expected to have ideas because they're kind of very far removed from what you're actually doing. But sometimes that really helps to have that uh, outside perspective. Moving on from, from the communication side of things, uh, shipping and iterating. Again, something we, we do fairly often as engineers. Uh, this is built into a lot of things that, that, that we do with, with agile practices and things. We ship the smallest amount of code. We ship a MVC and we, we iterate from there. That's pretty common. But we, we would do this with uh, messaging and uh, process changes and things like that. We would sort of ship the smallest version of it first and then go from there because it makes it so much easier to do as I said before and shut up and listen and actually change things if you've not actually tried to change too much at the beginning. So start small, make a, uh, a small change, make a small iteration and, and continue from there. And, and then, as I say, if you need to change that, you need to pivot from where you're going, it's a lot easier to do that when, when everything you're doing is, is incremental and small. Not waiting, for, not waiting for perfection uh, is, again, something that makes this a lot easier, right? Don't, don't get it perfect before you, you ship it out. If that's your code, 
if that's the, the messaging that you have out there, uh, if that's a process change, don't try and make it perfect before you put it out there because again, you're more reluctant to be able to change it when, when people have their opinions, when they have their thoughts. Um, it's gonna take longer uh, to get that initial thing out there. So when it's good enough, it's probably good enough. Uh, don't wait for perfection. Uh, get it out there, get them, get them opinions and get that feedback in as, as soon as you can. Yeah. Work, oh, these are out, that didn't, pretend internally is not there for a bit. <laughs> Work in the open, right? So this is something we do at GitLab, this is something that um, the WordPress community is really great at as well, which is why I'm happy to be sharing this here, right? Um, we are transparent by default, we are open core, which isn't quite open source, but close enough um, we as I said we have our handbook out in the open we have our meetings recorded a lot of these are on YouTube so you can go watch some it's bizarre but you can do that if you really want you can go watch our meetings um, it's great for us because we have people all over the world and we say well if you can't make a meeting that's fine all our meetings are optional um, there's an agenda ahead of time you can go back and watch the recording there's definitely times when I've not wanted to go to a meeting, so I just didn't, and I watched the recording at two times speed later on and just skipped over the bits I didn't care about. Like, there's a lot of benefits to being transparent and being out in the open. Um, internally pops in. Uh, this can be difficult for some people, right? Because being that transparent and, and having all of these things available to everyone is, um, Sometimes there's legal reasons why you can't do that, right? And ironically, since GitLab went public, uh, a lot less things are public because we're not allowed to, to put things out there for like insider trading rules. So work internally in the open, at least. Make sure your teams can, can self-serve. They can see the decisions you're making. They can see why you're making them decisions and, and they can jump into them, their meetings that we were, we were talking about before and they can share their opinions and their ideas. Um, you know, uh, internally is not as good as totally open, but it, it's a lot better than, than doing things behind closed doors and just going, here's the decision we made, we deal with it, essentially. Um, this slide is intentionally left blank. This is where I would take a sip of water, but I forgot to bring my water, so. Uh. <laughs> Lessons learned, summing up. Um, I realize I've gone through this very quickly. As I said, there's, there's time at the end for some questions. There's a transcript and, and a little bit more detail on, on what I actually did while I was there and a little bit more about GitLab side of things uh, on, on my website, sam.beckham.io. Um, but in summary, if you collaborate effectively, drive results, be efficient, include everyone, iterate continually, and be transparent by default, um, you'll be a much better communicator. And communication is crucial. Uh, this, is, this is something we can all do regardless of our role, whether we are uh, leaders of, of huge organizations, whether we're the engineers doing the work, or, or whether we're just doing things at home, right? Like all of these things can, well, not all of these things, you don't want to be measuring results at home, but you get the point, right? Like uh, a lot of these things, or maybe you do, uh, a lot of these things uh, apply to, to all of us in various different ways. Uh, and for a message to be heard, it should be repeated three times in three different places and in three different ways. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll heavily caveat this with I'm the wrong person to answer this question, so this may be wrong, but essentially it's, we're, we're open source in all the places that we can be. Um, there's certain bits with licensing and um, certain features and things that aren't inside the, the open. So we have an, an open source repo and then we have like a secondary one that's not quite fully open source. It's complicated, I don't fully understand it. The point is, it's open source, but not quite really. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. 
Yes. Hi. So, um, thinking about you know we are a very transparent organisation, and how do you deal with it when someone joins and they've not worked in that sort of way? And you know when you talk about shipping and iterating, especially when it comes to processes and getting that MVP out there and building on it, like I'm totally like I'm there with you. But people who are not familiar with that often go into sort of I, a I need to like do the whole process, all the permutations of all of the different things, and not only that, but I have to get it completely right before I share it with the world. And then they, they do that, and then they share it, and then they get loads of feedback on it, and they're like, oh my god, what am I gonna do with all this? So how do you deal with that sort of mismatch between what people are used to in the past in like traditional organizations where people would do that, and this sort of new, sort of much more iterative, collaborative, you know, feedback-driven way of working? Yes, it's very difficult. Uh, so <laughs> we, we, we call this the GitLab firehose, right? So it's this torrent of information that comes at you. So when you're onboarding, it's like you have, th there's an onboarding issue that you have. And when I joined, it said, read the handbook, uh, which if you've seen the handbook is impossible. It's like by the time you finish reading it, it's changed enough that you need to start from the beginning again and keep going. Um, so I think a lot of that is on uh, the management and on the teams to make sure that people know like, you know, here's, here's where you can go to self-serve. Um, but if you can't, like, speak up, like, give us feedback on, on where we're letting you down in, in your role as well, right? Um, to be honest, after a little while, the, the feeling of everything being transparent, you don't even realize it's, it's there. You don't realize what you're doing is in, in the open a little bit, right? So um, I was working on a, a merge request before and, and somebody from I don't even know where they were from. They just came from, from nowhere and were like, oh, I think you should do it this way. I'm like, who is this? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on here? Uh, and then you start to realize that like, you know, people can see what you're doing. Um, but the, the main thing is like, just being there and supporting them and making sure that they know, what, they know that it's a big shift and that you know that it's a big shift as well, right? And, and eventually it, it clicks. It does take a little while. Some people more than others. Did that, does that help? Yes. Uh, if you work in a company that's remote by design, yes. uh, what biggest challenge do you face with being remote uh, and how novel ways did you tackle that specific problem? Two, two big challenges. One is, is exactly the question that Siobhan just asked, right? Like, how do you see that someone's struggling when you don't see them? right like they're the other side of the world so i have uh, one of my engineers is in uh, sydney so we have like no overlap at all so meeting meeting with him half of the year i meet him really late on uh, and then the clocks shift and then i meet him really early on uh, it's it's a whole thing so that that's difficult um but again with with practice it it, it feels it has to feel normal but the the thing i always say is going to be the most difficult thing about this level of remote work for me is if I ever had to do any other job where I sit in an office, I'd go completely mad and, and, and hate it. But uh, yeah, it's that disconnect from people, which is why things like this are great. Like you can, you can come see loads of people and I'm technically still working today, so that's good. Okay, thank good. you very much, Sam. Thank you.